Let's listen to this, people. So I have sworn to you that I will not be angry with you, and I will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall never depart from you. That's not Isaiah talking. That's not me talking. That's God talking. God's love shall never depart from you. It's interesting to me that it says, in overflowing anger, for a moment, I hid my face. For a moment. But then the next verse, it says, but with everlasting love. I don't know how real you think this is or how much that changes your mind on what on who God is in our lives. <clears throat> Another verse it says in number six, this is Lord, this is God talking to Moses. He tells Moses, he says, Tell the sons, you should tell the people of Israel. This is what you should tell them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance up. Upon you and give you peace. God said in this small verse twice that he's going to show his face to you. His face is a sign of approval. His presence is a sign of acceptance, of adoption. This is who God is. So when, we look, so when God looks at you, we, we, we tend to, to ask ourselves, how is this possible? When God looks at me, God sees sin. Right? God sees all the bad stuff I've done, all the wrong that I've done. God sees sin. So how is it possible that God can love me as a sinner? How is it possible that God can love me knowing all the wrong that I've done? How can he accept me, adopt me, and approve of me, and, and know all that I have done in my life? That's an interesting thing to think about. How can God know you so well and still love you so much? That's who God is. God is love. God hates sin, yes. And we still sin and we still struggle and God can't smile at sin. God can't look at sin. God can't be where sin is. He is holy. We are not. So how is it that God, preacher, how is it that you're telling me that God is accepted of me, is adopted of me, and is approved of me in the presence of sin? Yes, you're right. God hates sin. Yes. God hates sin so much that he sent his son down, to die on a cross in your place, to take the wrath that you deserved so that you can receive the blessing that you didn't deserve. That's what God is. That's who God is. That's what he's done. Colossians 3, 3, 4 says this, for you have died and your life is now hidden in Christ. Your life is hidden in Christ. With God, when Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear. Pretty much what this verse is saying is that when God looks at you, he, see, he sees his son Jesus. Those of us who are in Christ, remember that big phrase, in Christ, he sees his son Jesus. So everything that Jesus is, you are. say this over here to this side. Everything that Jesus is to the Father, so are you. So let me, let me ask you this, and you can answer me. Has God ever been mad at Jesus? No. And so, why do we walk around thinking that God is somehow mad at us? Why do we have that image of God in our face? You do that one more time and it's, and it's the time out corner for you. Why do we have this image of God, this, this, this punishing God? This is what John says in 1 John. By this, love is perfected with us so that we have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as Jesus is to the Father, so are we in this world. As Jesus is to, the God, to God, so are we because we have been justified by grace through faith. My past, present, and future sins have all been paid for at the cross of Jesus Christ. That's how. That's why you can be accepted. That's why you can be adopted. That's why you can be approved. Because Jesus took your place. Because Jesus took your place. 
Even in the midst of struggles and pains and shortcomings and failures, God is looking at you with a heavenly smile saying, that's my son, that's my daughter. I love her, I love him, she is mine, he is mine, I died for them. That's God's lingo, that's God's face, that's God's mind. That's what God thinks of you. So how can we identify as people of God? First we have to get, we have to identify who God is and what God thinks of us. And this is what he thinks of us. He has accepted us, he has adopted us, and he has approved of us. This is why a righteous man can fall seven times and get up eight because your righteousness is not earned. You didn't earn this position. You didn't earn God's love. God freely gave it. God freely gave it because of his abounding love. There's a scripture in, in, in Moses' life where he says, God, God, I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory, God. And it's in this passage that we see where God says, well, no man can see my face. I'm holy. No man can see my face and live. But I'll show you my backside. I'll show you the bottom, the bottom of my robe. The bottom of my robe. I'll show you that. And, and even with that, when Moses went down, came down from that mountain, his face was glowing. Something was different about him. People knew he had been in a different place. People knew that he had experienced something different. He looks different. That's a glow. We can't even be in front of it. It's so astounding, so marvelous, so great. Fast forward to Jesus, who is the personification of God, who is the very face of God, who is God. And he is here today. And he's not saying to you, I can't show you my face, but I'll show you my robe. No, Jesus is saying, look at me because I'm looking at you. Because I see you. Because I've identified you. Because I've chosen you. Because I've adopted you. Because I paid the price for you. Because I love you. Because I'm with you. And because I'll always be with you. And because I am God. Look at me. I'm here. It's a powerful story in the New Testament. We see Jesus. Jesus is going on his way to heal a 12-year-old girl. Many of you probably know the story where there's a woman with a problem of a blood flow of 12 years right behind him. And the numbers are cool and everything, but there's one passage, one verse, three words in this sentence that stand out to me as one of the most powerful phrases in all of Scripture, if I can say that. Jesus is on his way to heal this girl, and there's a crowd, a multitude of people just hovering him, touching him, touching him. And this one woman behind him says, I know that I'm not supposed to be here. I know that people kicked me out of society because of my disease. I know that it's shameful for me to be here. I carry shame because of this condition I have. But if I could just touch Jesus, if I could just touch the bottom of his garment, I'll be healed. I'll be healed. So she pushed her way. Man, she pushed her way through that. And she finally got to the bottom of his garment. And she touched it. And Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped. And he said, somebody touched me. And Peter looks at him and says, yeah, a whole bunch of people touched you. We're in a crowd, Jesus. That's kind of how this works. I touched you. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Somebody touched me with faith. Somebody touched me looking for something. Somebody touched me yearning for something. Somebody touched me because they needed something. I'm just saying that we need God. I need you, God. And she touched him with that necessity flowing through her whole body. And these are the most powerful words that I can say in Scripture. If I can say that, and Jesus says, it says, Jesus turned around and looked for the woman who touched him. And he said, who touched me? I need to see you. In a, in, a, in a society where this woman should have been rejected, in a society where this woman should have been isolated, in a society where this woman should have been shamed, should have been stoned, should have been locked in a cage because of her condition, 
Jesus said, I need to find her. I need to see her. And she says, Jesus, it was me. I touched her. Can you imagine the shame on her body, on, in her? She was like, oh, here we go. She has that image of God in her mind. Like, don't you dare touch me again without the proper authorization. Without praying the right prayers. Without reading a, 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 a Bible chapter a day. Don't you dare approach me like that again. Thank you, Jesus. No, she looked, he looked at her and he said, woman, look at me. Take heart. Take cheer. Be glad. I could picture Jesus smiling at her because he had known what just happened. She was healed. And she knew it too. But the shame that was around her in the other people had to be blocked out by Jesus. So what did Jesus do? He said, he looked at her and he said, take heart. Don't pay attention to all these other people. Look at me. Look at me. Focus on me. He said, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Go and sin no more. I accept you. I have chosen you. I am pleased with you. I'm approved. I'm approving you. Go and sin no more. If we could just have that image of God in our minds. If we could just see that God, the true God, by the way, in our minds, it'll change the way we live. It'll change the way we do life. It'll change the way we approach God. If we could just see God like that, smiling at us. But we can't. It's hard for us. It's hard for us because we see our sin. We see our shame. We see our depression. We see our anxiety. We live with it day by day. So when God is here telling us, I've taken care of all of that, we, we, we respond to God and say, no, you didn't. I still struggle with it. I'm still messing with I'm still falling. Why is it that you can sit there with your feet up? That's what the Bible says, that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father with his seat up. How can you sit there and say, no, no, you're good. I've approved of you. I've accepted you. I've adopted you. When I'm still struggling with the shame of trying to be good, of trying to live up, of trying to do what you want me to do, God. I can't identify as your son. I can't identify as your daughter when I don't do the things that a son of a king or a daughter of a king would do. And yet we live our lives from that mentality where I got to earn my sonship. I got to earn my daughtership. Let me ask you a question. What did you do to be your parents' kid? You were just born. No, I hope they love you, but they could have looked at you and said, nah. I'm just kidding. Your parents love you. I love you. But, but you didn't choose to be born. You didn't choose your parents. But nonetheless, they looked at you and said, this is my child. This is mine. This is blood of my blood, flesh of my flesh. This is why Jesus had to die, because he had to purchase you blood of his blood and flesh of his flesh. That's what makes you a son. That's what makes you a daughter. And no amount of shame, no amount of sin, no amount of rejection, no amount of depression, of suicidal thoughts, no amount of any of that can stop God's love from reaching you. The Bible says nothing can separate you from the love of God. And then it describes everything. Neither angels, nor demons, nor principalities, nor life, nor death. And then he concludes it all up and says, nor everything else in creation can separate you from the love of God. Not even your shame that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Not even your brokenness that you see every time you go to sleep. That just creeps up in your mind. Like, how can I be of God if I'm thinking thoughts that are not of God? I, I can't do this. You see, there's, there's, there's a beautiful... There's a beautiful picture in all of this. You see, because God doesn't pick perfect people. Blessed are we who, in Christ who has given us every spiritual blessing, said Paul in Ephesians. He's given you everything. You didn't deserve this. You didn't do anything for this. He's given you everything in the midst of your brokenness. He's poured out his spirit on you in the midst of your pain. He's identified you in the midst of broken people, a broken world, and he said, I choose you. 
I choose you. I choose you. And yet we, we struggle to find the balance between how can God say that of me when I still have this, carry this shame, carry this burden. This is why. This is why. There's this, there's this, uh, there's this style of, of, of pottery um, that is done in, in Asia. Uh, and it's called Kintugi. Has anybody heard of Kintugi? No? Neither have I until I, I looked it up. But Kintugi is the practice of, of, of pottery where it, it takes broken pieces and it, and it molds it together with a, with a gold, with a, with a glue. You can see it right there on the screen. And it molds it together. See, the beautiful thing about this potter, this pottery, this cup, is the brokenness. The beautiful thing about this, this, this art is that it's broken. You wouldn't go to Target and buy something that looks like that. You cannot get the, the, the clear one, the one that's fixed. This one's broken. But yet Jesus, using that metaphor, walked into Target and said, no, I want that one. I want that one. That's the one I want. That one's mine. And that's, what, that's, that's God's position to you right now. That's God's status towards you. He said, no, I've identified you as mine. And nothing you do can change that. Nothing you do can change that. Who we are is dependent on who God is. Our identity is based on God's identity. And we need to get that right. Who is God? What has God done for us? He's, adop he's, a, he's accepted you into his family. He's adopted you as a son, as a daughter. He's approved of you. That means he's pleased with you. And even if you fall, you fall in the right direction because the spirit convicts us of every sin. If he's there to say, rise up, my child. Rise up, my daughter. Rise up, my son. I am with you. This is the God that we serve. That even in our brokenness, God says, I want you. That even in our shame, God says, no, I choose you. My favorite scripture that I use as a, as, as a golden, as, a, as an art for my faith is, is Romans 8.1, where he says, therefore, now, that's like, finally, finally, there is no arguing this, therefore, right now, somebody say now, now. there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus. That should be our mantra. That should be the way that we wake up every day. Like today, no condemnation. And man, it'll free you. It'll free you from what you're struggling with. It'll free you from what you're facing. It'll free you from, from, from the, the attacks of the world, from the lust of the flesh, of the eyes. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because I and the righteousness of Christ Jesus. I am accepted, I am, I am adopted, and I am approved by God. Sealed is the word that the Bible uses for us believers. We have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I struggle. I struggle opening mails that are sealed. I always break it. It's, it's intended. You can, obviously, you can break the seal, but I'm saying that that God has sealed you as his. And there's nothing that can change that. Who is God? Amen. God is love. God is, accept God is accepting. God adopts. Amen. And God approves of you. In Christ. That's why we have to make sure that we are in Christ. We are in Christ. In Christ. Blessed be the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed us. In Christ, with every spiritual blessing, you have all that you need for this spiritual life. The but Peter says in another scripture, he says, God has given you everything you need for this life. Every spiritual need to walk in Christ. You have it all. 
If we were playing poker, you'd have a royal flush. The highest hand, the winning hand. That's why we have nothing to prove. Who are we working for? What are we trying to prove? And, be and better, better question, who are we trying to prove it to? God, you don't need to prove anything to God because God's already accepted you, adopted you, and approved of you. Finale, a trio. So who are you trying to prove this to? Can I answer that question? You're trying to prove it to yourself. Because you have to, we still have to live with this, this life. And so that's why Paul says, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I got to crucify myself with Christ. So that not I live, but that Christ lives in me. You see, this is the key of the whole thing. When we figure out that our identity is based on who Jesus is and his identity, now we have to say, okay, I want that. That's my identity. Who are you? Who do you belong to? I belong to Christ. I belong to Christ. I belong to Christ. I am his and he, I am his and he is mine. It's what the Bible says. Man, and I just want to pray to you, if, I, if the guy who plays the piano can come up and we can kind of spiritualize this. I don't, I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know if, 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 you, if you have struggled, have struggled to believe whether, whether this is true about you. It may be true about somebody else, preacher, but I don't think that's true about me. Can I tell you something? God is here to meet you. God is here to meet you today. Not with a waving finger, not with a mad face, not with a confused face of what are you doing, but of a face of, of a loving smile, of a loving father saying, I've waited for this day. I've waited for this day. Where I can tell you the truth, that you are mine, that nothing, you have nothing to prove. I've already given you everything you need. That's why we sing, I need you. That's why we sing, I need you. When we go into the world, we say things like, yo, I need this. And I need more of that. And I need more of this. And I need a little bit more of that. Because the world can't, 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 can't give us contentment like God can. The world can't give us contentment like God can. We don't sing, we don't sing, God, I, I need you to do this. And if we do, it's because we need God to be here with us. God, we don't need nothing else but you. Amen. We don't need nothing else but you. Amen. I don't know how many of you can say that today. I need you. I need you. Lord, we have nothing left to prove, God. My identity is in you, Jesus. My identity is in you. What else do I have to prove? Who am I proving it to? What am I proving? The Bible in Hebrews refers to, to Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. That means that Jesus is holding the pen to your life. And that he decides where it goes and where it goes. And we need to trust in him and hope in him and faith in him because he is our source. He is our, he is, he is our foundation. And right there if you are, if you could just stand up to your feet.